Recently in my luxury bubble bursting video, I pointed out how Prada and Miu Miu were both bucking current economic trends. And today I wanna to deep dive a little bit more into the house of Miu Miu, which we haven't really talked about much here on this channel. And we're going to kind of come to an understanding of how Prada's little sister brand Miu Miu became Prada Group's powerhouse. Now to understand, you know, how we got to where we are now in 2024, we first have to start in the very humble beginning in 1992 when Muccia Prada first established the Miu Miu brand. Now the name Miu Miu comes from obviously Muccia's family nickname for her. This was supposed to be a way for Muccia Prada to kind of break away from Prada and give herself some creative freedom, a little bit more liberty as far as styling and aesthetics go. And this was kind of like her laboratory, her experiment, if you will, because when it comes to these kind of things, she couldn't have done that in the space that Prada was in because it was already a well-established luxury brand. Now, because this was supposed to be more of a creative, free thinking outlet, Miu Miu was already positioned to appeal to a younger demographic, which Prada itself was not targeting at the time through its marketing campaigns. And that brings us to the first collection in 1993. Now, this first collection, you guys, it is phenomenal. It is everything mid-90s that is, is good and golden, and it's it's really kind of pulling from like Americana vibes, that, that country aesthetic that was taking both interiors and fashions by storm. I mean, hello, literally look at Annie Potts on Designing Women. That, that, that country aesthetic had a stronghold on everything stylistically during that period. From the start, Miu Miu had kind of some difficulties with uh, creating its own brand identity and really breaking away from Prada and the idea that Miu Miu was just a cheaper diffusion brand. Now listen, when you're starting a new brand, you do have to kind of keep price points within relative reason. You can't come out of the gate with $4,000 mini skirts. You have to kind of think like, okay, we need to start getting more customers over to this brand. And this was never meant to be like a huge profit workhorse that it has become today. Like I said, this was just Muccia Prada's kind of experiment, if you will. Part of the reason why the, the initial reaction was like, oh, you know, it's just a just a diffusion brand is because the 1993 seasons from both Miu Miu and Prada both relied heavily on the same aesthetics. Now with Miu Miu, we had a lot of French suede jackets, French skirts, we had prairie skirts, a lot of Western cowgirl themed aesthetics. And we also saw a lot of that carry over to Prada. Granted, the Prada side of things was a little bit more refined, a little bit more, dare I say, Prada-esque in relation to the Miu Miu drop. But overall, like both, both collections though were like, amazing peak 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 aesthetic we haven't seen a lot of in this first collection if you will we haven't seen a lot of the Miu Miu characteristics that we've come to know today obviously cowgirl aesthetic is a lot farther off than like say like the mod aesthetic that Miu Miu was known for in the 2000s and that deconstructed preppy luxury retro office wear chic that they're known for today so we're gonna see as we move through the history of Miu Miu a lot of those aesthetics that the brand is now known for today, the hallmarks, if you will, come into play. But before we dive into all that, hey guys, my name's Caleb. I post luxury and lifestyle related content three times a week on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. So if that's something you're into, make sure to hit the subscribe button down below. Consider joining our membership. We have an awesome engaged community. We're having a members meet up with a big weekend of luxury shopping. If that's something you're into, check it out. Let's move through the product history a little bit and then we're gonna deep dive into some of the newer collections because they're oh so good. Now the brand kind of jumped around throughout the rest of the 90s and they they achieved some mid-level critical success. Now listen, the brand was pretty diverse as it was already. They already offered a full line lineup of products, including ready-to-wear, handbags, shoes, you name it. They were doing pretty well. They were obviously, you know, we're still pricing ourselves a little low in comparison to more established brands because we don't have that brand identity yet. We don't have that desirability that much larger established brands like Prada were able to, 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 to demand. We're still seeing a profit, but it's not quite with those higher margins that they're able to do with today's reputation and markup. So then in spring, summer 99, they released the men's collection, which is Oh, so good. If I was much thinner and could find some, I would definitely be buying a lot of vintage men's Miu Miu because it is 100% a vibe. I know I say that a lot, but I truly do mean it. Now, this collection was very ahead of their time. For the first runway show, they actually did like a whole play performance instead of just a catwalk, which is very fascinating. Kind of, again, ahead of their time with, you know, now the fashion shows, we have to have like a break in the middle for like some new aspiring pop star to sing and it's a lot, but even with the two diverse collections, the men's, the women's, and having a full product range, the price points were still 40 to 50% less than what Prada was asking at Prada. <laughs> We're still, we're getting that that feeling of a diffusion brand, and I myself am guilty of that. Even throughout the 2000s, I kind of considered Miu Miu like more of like an entry-level, younger, it-girl aesthetic 
Prada. Now, because North American marketing has never been Miu Miu's strong suit, we're going to dive into that a little bit when it comes to the market and what regions it performs in well, what regions it doesn't. Spoiler alert, it does not perform well here in North America, unfortunately, but we'll get into that here in a minute. And we would see this recurring theme of like diffusion brand energy well into the late 2000s until Prada Group finally decided to fully back the Miu Miu project, if you will, and really help give the brand its own identity. And after Prada Group fully backed Miu Miu, another way that they were able to differentiate the two brands from each other is where they were shown. Historically, Miu Miu and Prada had both been shown in Milan, so instead they moved Miu Miu's shows up to Paris. They still kept menswear in Milan for some reason, and they kept Prada in Milan as well, which, which really helped kind of separate the two brands, give them both their own identity, and let them really step into their own right. And that brings us to Autumn Winter 2011, when everything seemed to turn around for the brand. Now, this first viral major breakthrough came through in the form of the cat eye sunglasses. Now, you guys, these sunglasses are still so iconic, you can still buy them today. These were such a huge success for the brand Miu Miu because they garnered over 363 million US dollars in sales alone for those sunglasses. Typically, luxury eyewear is made by the Luxottica Group, and Andrea Guerra, who was originally a chief at Luxottica, is now the current CEO over at Prada Group. And this is gonna come into play here in a minute when, once we get more into the marketing aspect of things. Now, after the sunglasses, the next truly viral moment, in my opinion, for the brand Miu Miu came in the form of their spring-summer 2022 collection. Now, during this time, you have to think culturally, we're kind of working towards post-pandemic. We're all begrudgingly heading back to the office, Muccia really took that moment to kind of create a new conversation around business wear, dress code, etiquette, when it comes to the workplace. And for the first time, she debuted clothing that had been like raw edged, cropped, because typically when you think of Prada, when you think of Miu Miu, you're thinking of beautiful Italian tailoring, beautiful colors, materials, things like that. But but for this moment, she really kind of took the the idea that we're all like, not wanting to go to the office. We haven't been in the office for a couple of years. What we're doing is we're, we're cutting up our clothing in an act of rebellion. This sent Miu Miu over the edge. Whether you were on TikTok, flipping through magazines, whatever you were looking at, you were always confronted with the Miu Miu set, that, that cut off mini skirt, that deconstructed look with the midriff top. This really propelled Miu Miu to a point where they were becoming incredibly profitable and almost leading Prada Group. Now, surprisingly enough, we've also seen a return, if you will, or a resurgence in popularity of the Matt Lizze handbags. Now, the first time we saw Muccia Prada manipulate leather in such a way was in the form of the spring-summer 2008. There was a clutch with some gathered leather, which, you know, eventually, I think it was 2011 again or early 2010s when they finally released what they're known for, the Matt Lasse leather. Now with this collection, you guys, these bags are, they're stunning, don't get me wrong. They were, they were looking a little dated there for a little bit at the end of the 2010s, but now with newer silhouettes, they're really embracing that like Y2K mod, a culture aesthetic. The Arcadia handbag is literally at the top of my list. Like I am loving this East West vibe. You know I love my Celine Boogie, so obviously by, you know, rationale of deduction. I would probably love the Acadia bag too. These bags, you guys, are stunning. They have the hobo, which is popular. They have so many neat materials, wicker, uh, crocheted to look like raffia. The accessories collection over at Miu Miu, they are coming in strong. And we're seeing these in the form of all sorts of campaigns. And that's especially evident with Gigi Hadid at the head of the North American campaign. I see pretty exciting things for the accessories segment of Miu Miu. Now it's no secret luxury handbags can be a make or break for a designer brand. And right now, I think we're gonna start seeing them a lot more and hopefully here in North America. Now, when it comes to their global success, it's kind of interesting. It's very split between the East and the West. Now, when it comes to the East, literally in Seoul, there are 10 boutiques, 10 in one city alone. Now, when it comes to North America, split between Los Angeles and New York, they share five boutiques between the two cities. Here, as noted in the Vogue article by Andrea Guerra, who originally was at Luxottica, the makers of those famous cat eye sunglasses, he states, I really hope that North America will be a fantastic, good surprise for 2024. I think there are a lot of reasons why we would see this, and 50% of the answer is on us. We are underrepresented in the U.S. We have not always curated all the aspects of the North America efficiently. We're putting in a ton of work, so I think the U.S. has to be a leading wagon for us in our next years. And 
that could not be more true. I think especially as pop cultures and more celebrities are garnering the Miu Miu products and ready to wear, it's gonna be shoved down our faces a lot more and we need to be able to have the outlet to purchase these things. So I'm hoping that we have a little bit more representation of Miu Miu here in the States and a little bit more accessibility to the products. I think for them to truly be successful and considering that even with North America so underrepresented for the Miu Miu brand, the fact that they were able to achieve 89% year on year for Q1 this year speaks volumes. They should be putting a little bit more of that money and investing into a bigger North American presence. Now I think after over 30 years, Miu Miu is finally stepping into its own. It's, it's picking up stride, it's picking up relevancy within pop culture, and we're seeing that all over social media, in, in both print media, on TV, on our Instagrams. Like, they're really taking off. So I think that that for the time being, Miu Miu is finally achieving what it had set out to be. It's a playground for Miu Chia Prada to really experiment with, let herself be more creative and color outside the lines, but it's also bringing in profitability and kind of prominence to the Prada group. I'm gonna be very interested to see if we're still talking about Miu Miu. Like, listen, they've recently released those, never thought I would say this on my channel, those satin panties, <laughs> which people are wearing above their skirts. I know I said it, safe space. You know, like the whole like Sagar aesthetic, which was very relevant in Y2K, I am ashamed to admit. My old navy boxers would be hanging out the top of my jeans back then too when I was in middle school, but it was another time. And we're also seeing the popularity of the ballet flat, especially since ballet core is slowly, you know, building steam and, and kind of coming into the, the forefront of fashion as we're moving away from like the quiet luxury, the mob wives and all the other geek chic aesthetics that we've been playing with. As long as they keep their finger on the pulse of trends and Mucia is still feeling inspired and they really invest in North America, I see amazing things from Miu Miu, and I'm honestly pretty excited for the brand, and maybe I'll have an unboxing later this year, because the more I'm looking at this stuff, like, I am falling in love. Anyway, guys, let me know down in the comments. Is Miu Miu a brand that you've dabbled in? Is it something you own? Is it something you love? Are you one of those diehard collectors? Let's get a conversation going around Miu Miu down in the comments. Until next time, stay safe, have fun. I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.